The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Welcome to worship where we assure you of God's love and grace in digital and virtual form. Sometimes we feel that God agrees with us 100% politically, socially and theologically. If that is the case, we most likely have created an idol that is based on our own preferences, that is nothing but a reflection of us. As long as the kingdom of God is not part of this earth, God always calls us to change. God always calls us to love those we don't like, we don't agree with, and who look differently and who live differently. Changing our hearts about those others, that is hard. God loves you no matter what, but God also calls us to pour that love back into the world again, and not only to those we deem worthy, but to everybody who is in need of grace. That is what a welcoming church is supposed to do. Invite people in and check our opinions about them at the door. They need to hear the gospel. They need to encounter Christ in the sacraments just as we do. That's our purpose. So I invite you to listen carefully to the words you will sing in our gathering hymn, All are welcome. And then let's try to live up to the words we sing. That's probably a fake it until you make it enterprise. We also welcome our listeners on the radio. And when the people on the radio want to see what's going on, please come to www.gototrinity.org and 2 is a number to www.gototrinity.org and follow the link that takes you to this virtual service. Gracious and holy God, lead us from death to life, from falsehood to truth. Lead us from despair to hope, from fear to trust. Lead us from hate to love, from war to peace. Let peace fill our hearts, our world, our universe, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, you direct our lives by your grace, 
and your words of justice and mercy reshape the world. Mold us into a people who welcome your word and serve one another through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Today is the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. I would like to talk about the Gospel reading for today, which is taken from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus says, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. God is the one who sent Jesus. The most important thing to know about Jesus is that Jesus welcomes all people with the same kind of love and respect. In this picture, you can see how Jesus welcomes the children in a village in Cameroon, Africa. This sign shows us how Jesus welcomes a person in a wheelchair to church. In our country, the United States of America, we have a long-standing tradition of welcoming refugees and immigrants. Where might this family come from? In this picture, we can see how American people welcome Jewish immigrants from Russia. Many Jewish people had to flee Russia about 100 years ago. They were murdered by Russian police and Christian neighbors. As followers of Jesus, let us always remember that Jesus welcomes all people with the same kind of love and respect. A reading from the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah responded to Hananiah as they stood in front of all the priests and people at the temple. He said, Amen. May your prophecies come true. I hope the Lord does everything you say. I hope he does bring back from Babylon the treasures of this temple and all the captives. But listen now to the solemn words I speak to you in the presence of all these people. The ancient prophets who preceded you and me spoke against many nations, always warning of war, disaster, and disease. So a prophet who predicts peace must show he is right. Only when his predictions come true can we know that he is really from the Lord. The word of the Lord. A reading from Psalm 89. I will sing of the Lord's unfailing love forever. Old and young will hear of your faithfulness. Your unfailing love will last forever. Your faithfulness is as enduring as the heavens. The Lord said, I have made a covenant with David, my chosen servant. I have sworn this oath to him. I will establish your descendants as kings forever. They will sit on your throne from now until eternity. Happy are those who hear the joyful call to worship, for they will walk in the light of your presence, Lord. They rejoice all day long in your wonderful reputation. They exult in your righteousness. You are their glorious strength. It pleases you to make us strong. Yes, our protection comes from the Lord, and he, the Holy One of Israel, has given us our King. Here ends the reading. A reading from the letter to the Romans. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you have you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God, once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey the teachings we have given you. 
Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Because of the weakness of your human nature, I am using the illustration of slavery to help you understand all this. Previously, you let yourselves be slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led ever deeper into sin. Now you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living so that you will become holy. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. And what was the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do, things that end in eternal doom. But now you are free from the power of sin and have, and have become slaves of God. Now you do these things that lead to holiness and result in, in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel for this Sunday from Matthew chapter 10. Jesus says, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord.
I bring you greetings this morning. It's a delight to be with you. Uh, it's a delight to be with all of you throughout the Southwestern Washington Synod and beyond that. Uh, we're physically separated, we're geographically separated, but uh, today the Holy Spirit brings us together. We are a community together, the Holy Spirit brings us together. And as we say in the Apostles' Creed, we are the communion of saints by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, no matter who we are, we are one in Christ. And actually, that's what Jesus is talking about in the Gospel lesson today. That's what Jesus is talking about. He's saying to us, you're in different places, you're different people, you're not all identical, you don't think the same, you don't look the same, but Christ, the Spirit of Christ brings you together because you are united by the Holy Spirit. You are united by the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, you are one with me and you are one with the one who sent me. And you also are one with each other in deeper ways than you even know. During this uh, Pentecost season this year, we are uh, slowly making our way through the Gospel of St. Matthew. And all of the Gospel, four Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all have their own uh, particular theme, their own particular way of uh, describing the saving work of Christ. Uh, each writer has their own particular image and, and theme about what is the saving work that Christ does. And in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is, is seen as the one who comes to bring together a new community. We get separated from each other. The world gets broken apart. But in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is sent by God first to reveal to us and to assure us that we are one with God. By God's grace and love, we are one with God. But we also are one with another, and so we have community together. Have you ever felt uh, terribly alone and left out? That's happened to most of us at one time or the other. Or have you ever felt ignored and even, even pushed away or, or put down by other people? Once again, all of us often have some situation in which that happens. And that can happen to us individually in one-on-one -on -one relationships, but it can also happen to us collectively. We, can, we get divided up into groups and we push each other away. Right now in our world, right now in our nation, we are so divided. We are so separated from one another. We divide ourselves up in all kinds of ways. We, we divide ourselves up religiously. We look at other religious groups as being suspicious and threatening. Uh, we get divided up in terms of the political party that we're in, and we just start shouting at each other and don't even see where we agree on certain points. We get divided up economically into rich and poor, into urban and rural. And right now, especially very tragically, we're very much aware of how we get divided up. We form ourselves into groups according to the, to the color of our skin. The human family is broken into a thousand pieces. And Jesus comes, what the Gospel is talking about, the Gospel of Matthew and our Gospel day, Jesus comes to bring us back together in a community where we are connected to God and where we are connected to each other. This Gospel lesson is very short, it's only three short verses, but in those three short verses, uh, the word welcome is repeated six times. Jesus said, this is what it's all about. Welcome, 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 welcome. And what Jesus is saying is that at the core of our faith, at the core of our faith is the God who welcomes us. And that sets us free to welcome one another and to form community again. My father, Emil Jake, was a wonderful, open-hearted man, and he had one particular thing that he would do all the time that uh, I particularly appreciate, I particularly enjoyed, and that was is that every time we would visit uh, him and my mom at their house, we'd go up to the door and ring the doorbell, and dad would come and answer the door. And the first thing he would do when he opened the door is he would say, well, look who's here. He did it every time. It didn't matter if we had just been there the day before. The minute we opened up the door, he would say, well, look, he's, look who's here, as if we were the, the best surprise, the best treat that he was expecting that day. And when he did that, when we did that, when he did that, we knew that we were loved and that we were welcomed and that we were very much a part of the family. That is discipleship, said Jesus. 
That is discipleship. That you, that you welcome one another. Not only welcome one another to, to church on Sunday, although that's very important, keep on doing that, but also that you, by your interactions with people, that you help people realize that down at the very core of their being, they are part of, they are one of God's beloved, that you, you welcome them, that God is welcoming them, that you let people know in the way you interact that they are so much a part of God's family and God's community. And that once you have welcomed each other, that you also work together to form that community, to deepen that community, so that all people might know God's love. We need that so much right now. Our nation is so divided and so shattered right now into all kinds of different groups. We need Jesus to come and lead us and inspire us to build community again. And I'm thinking, especially right now, how, how are we are so divided by, by racism. We are so divided by our ingrained racist patterns of how we value some and not value others according to the color of one's skin. Two Wednesdays ago, on June 17th, our synod and all 65 synods in the uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, we commemorated the murder of the Emmanuel Nine. What I mean by that, as I'm, I'm sure you know, is that five years ago, on June 17th, 2015, a young white man, a young white Lutheran man, went into the Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, and murdered nine members of a Bible study happened that day and critically wounded a tenth. The young man, Dylan Roof, uh, had been welcomed into the Bible study. The members of the Bible study, all African-American, welcomed Dylan in. They were talking with him. They sensed that he was troubled. They sensed that he was tense. They tried to dialogue with him and they assured him of God's love. But Dylan, Dylan Roof wasn't wanting community that day. Uh, investigators later discovered on his website and through other sources that he had gotten heavily involved in the white supremacist movement. He wanted to start a race war. He, in his words, he wanted to purge America of people of color. And so in that moment, he did not want community. And so he took out his gun and killed the Emanuel Nine. It was a horrible act in and of itself. It was a horrible act that deserves our pain and grief in and of itself, that a young Lutheran man would do this. But it was also uh, a tragic sign of the judgment and racism that exists at large within our country. Not only the racism that expresses itself in violent acts, such as Dylan's killing of the nine, but also the racism, also the judgments we have about each other that are present in all the different social patterns, all the patterns that are kind of ingrained in how we interact with each other, in which, as I said before, people are judged and valued or disvalued or even killed, even treated violently, based on the color of their skin. Sometimes af sometime after the killing took place, I was able to be part of a group of, of Lutheran bishops who met with a group of bishops from the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the, the AME denomination. The AME denomination is a very large denomination. It's, it's uh, comparable to the ELCA. It has two and a half million members, has 7,000 congregations here in the United States. And so we met Lutheran bishops and AME bishops as part of a process of reconciliation, as part of a process of we're wanting to work collaboratively, collaboratively with them but also as a time for us to confess and apologize that this killing had taken place by a Lutheran man. During that meeting, I remember talking to Bishop Robinson from North Carolina, a bishop of the AME Church. And what I was surprised to discover is that he was not only a bishop in the church, uh, he was also a recently retired police sheriff. It's, the, it's common in the AME Church that both pastors and bishops uh, both have a job in the church and they have a job in the community. They're in touch with their people. 
And for 30 years, Bishop Robertson had been on the police force of a particular city, a significant city in North Carolina. And for the last 10 years, he'd been the police chief of that city. And I was shocked when he told me that it, on a regular basis, both when he was police chief, but since he retired, on a regular basis, when he'd be driving home at night from a church meeting, he would be stopped by a white police officer. He said, they couldn't really see who I is. It was, it was, after, it was after sundown. They didn't see I, that I was the former police chief. They just could see that I was a black man driving a car through the city, and that in itself made me a figure of suspicion. And I thought to myself, how can this be? How can this be a man who is a bishop and also a former police sheriff? Shouldn't that, shouldn't that uh, guarantee him safety? Shouldn't that guarantee him respect and standing in his community? But it didn't, and it still doesn't. And I also reflected at that point about how I, as a white man, uh, do not expect and would not tolerate that kind of treatment like that. And I realized that the ingrained patterns of our society, the ingrained patterns which, which, in which we have grown to look at each other, those ingrained patterns give distinct advantages to me as a white man in terms of where I can go and where I can be respected. And those same ingrained patterns create deep pain and heartache and even the likelihood of extreme violence to people of color in our country. And we've witnessed that in, a, in, in tragic and awful ways. We have, re, re, we have witnessed that over these past weeks with the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis and Breonna Taylor, Taylor in Louisville and Rayshard Brooks in Atlanta. And it keeps happening and it keeps happening. And so it's for that reason that God comes to us. God says, I have a vision for you. I have, a, I have a passionate dream of who you will be. And so come, come and be community again. Come back together again. God says, that's why I sent my son Jesus. That's why I continue to send the spirit of Christ among you to help you to do that. Because, because you are one with me, says God, and you are, you are one with each other in a deeper way than you will ever know. Come, come, work with me. Be led by my spirit as we reform our community again. One of the things that I've come to see as I, as I read the Bible is that God particularly comes to help people who are in a time of distress. God particularly comes to help people who are being mistreated by others. Now, we may, not be, we may not be comfortable with this. We may not like this part, but this is what I see in Scripture, that God, again and again in the Bible, God comes to help those who are being pressed down by others. And that's why I am convinced that God is among us these days saying black lives matter. God is among us these days. The same God who heard the cries of God's people in Israel and freed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. The same God who through his son Jesus reached out to the Samaritans who were being pushed to the edges and tried to bring them back. The same God who through Jesus was willing to heal the daughter of a Canaanite woman who, the, who his disciples had before that just been pushing away because she was a person of a different group, a different tribe, a different race. God comes again and again to be with and to support and to work with people who are being pressed down and treated. And so that's why I am convinced that these days God is very much saying black lives matter. Justice matters. Children needing healthy diets and good schools, they matter. People, all people who are unemployed, the 40 million people who are unemployed, they matter right now. And there needs to be some recovery systems. There needs to be work to get people back to work. People who don't have affordable housing, all of that matters. Because God says to us, I come as your God because I want you to have life and have it in all of its fullness. I want you, first of all, to come and have, have life in your hearts. I want you to be restored to me in your hearts and your souls so that you know that you and I are one. 
but I also want healing for your bodies, and I want healing for your communities, and I want peace to come among you, and I want justice for your nation. I want life for you, says God. I want life for you, says Jesus, life in all of its fullness. When Jesus sent his disciples out to be disciples, when he sent them out into the world earlier in Matthew chapter 10, says that Jesus gave them power and authority and sent them out saying, go out there and heal the sick and, and cast out the demons that are oppressing people and bring life to people. And so this morning, Jesus is sending us out. This morning, Jesus is sending us out and Jesus is saying to us, I also give power to you. I give you wisdom and power and authority and clarity so that you can go out into the world, so that you can go out into the world to heal the sick, so that you can cast out the demons of racism and of hatred and of inequality and injustice that are plaguing the world right now. I send you out to do all those things. So once again, once again, you can become my beloved community. You already are, but you don't know that. So once again, you can be drawn together by the very Spirit of Christ to become the beloved community because that's who you are, and that's who I want you to be in all of its fullness, says the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. What did Kennedy say? We do these and the other things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Following Jesus is hard, but it's worth it. Join me in reciting the New Testament church. That's what Jesus thinks following Christ looks like. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourselves. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this everybody will know that you are my disciples, 
if you have love for one another. Called by God's grace to share the good news, we are the hands of Christ, opened by love, joined in worship, extended in welcome, offered in service, reaching for justice. We come to prayer today after the first full week of summer, and we're antsy to do what we usually do around here in the summer, like rooting for the home team or going to a backyard barbecue with hugs all around. We're stuck with reruns of baseball games and watching soccer teams on TV play with canned crowd noise. How good it will be to come back together on Sundays. We can hardly wait. But we will wait as long as we need to to keep our neighbors safe. Let our prayer response today be, hear our prayer. But let's close our eyes as we say it and imagine ourselves in our favorite pew. Lord God, we ask more than ever for guidance for all our political and health leaders, internationally, nationally, and for our state, county, and city representatives. We ask they have the common good as their priority. We ask that they have balanced understandings of solutions for injustice along racial lines, but for all people everywhere. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Tradition is front and center as Independence Day nears. This year, as we celebrate a long ago day, let our nation's motto, in God we trust, be more than words on our currency, but written freshly on our hearts. And let the other motto, one out of many, be a reminder that we are connected to each other, even though we feel alone at times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Rallies for freedom still reverberate around the world. Marches, slogans, and bullhorns announce and warn. Freedom from injustice is a high call. Your gospel's call, Lord Christ, gives us the freedom to do radical writing in your name as partner in bringing your kingdom to earth. To do that, we pray for the courage to see what we really don't want to see and the courage to be grace advocates for all lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So many needs remain among us that go without words or voice or action. We come and plea to be heard, but more to feel your embrace. Touch us, heal us, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The prophet Jeremiah spoke words of encouragement to a people tired of being tired in an exile beyond their control. God spoke to him with these words for his people. I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back home. For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not harm you, and plans to give you a hope and a future. Gracious God, whether we are proverbial prodigal children, exiles, or wandering in the wilderness, how we want to come home for the holiday. Encourage us with hope and make your plans known for us for a new kind of prosperous future for everyone, everywhere. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Peace is not the absence of war and a cold silence. That's an armistice, a breather, until we start the next round of conflict. Peace is a call to muster genuine goodwill toward our neighbors. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Today is our annual assembly. Due to the COVID crisis, we meet on Zoom. But the business of the church is not stopped, neither by the Black Death of the Middle Ages nor by novel coronaviruses of today. So please tune into the meeting that will set us up for the year to come. And 
open a new window in your browser and navigate to our online giving platform so that we can fund the budget we agreed upon at the annual assembly last year. For your really amazing generosity in these trying times, we thank you very much. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Water and word, wine and bread, these are signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. Communion is not a reward for the worthy, for those who share our theology and our worldview and who think that our way of being church is a non plus ultra only way that God approves of. And everything else is baloney. Jesus says that the physician comes to the sick, not to the healthy. God's grace is entirely for the undeserving, the suffering and those in need of grace. Communion is an invitation to the Lord's table and not to ours. That is why everybody is welcome to participate in communion, which happens not in this virtual form of service, but every Wednesday, as long as the pandemic forces us to stay apart on the Zoom teleconferencing platform. I hope to see you on Wednesday. Details you find on our website www go to trinity.org. Gathered and won by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I welcome everything that comes to me in this moment because I know it is for my healing. I welcome all thoughts, 
feelings, emotions, persons, situations and conditions. I let go of my desire for security. I let go of my desire for approval. I let go of my desire for control. I let go of my desire to change any situation, condition, person or myself. I open to the love and presence of God and the healing action and grace within. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. After this service, we meet on Zoom for a virtual coffee hour with virtual coffee brewed entirely from organic bits and bites. Check your email for access information. And then today at 1 p.m., we meet again on Zoom for our annual assembly. Please make it a priority to attend. And until then, go in peace and be agents of grace.